Hello, everyone. This is Keith Cup, CEO of Gravitas Impact Premium Coaches. And today we will be launching our Global Business Leaders Forum as we continue to focus on the war on COVID-19. And today we have two coaches that are experts in the specific area of profit and in this case, cash and cash flow. We have Ian Judson from Brisbane, Australia, and then also Keith Upkeys here from the Pacific Northwest in the Portland, Oregon area market. And the purpose of this forum is to invite any leader in business worldwide who's running a business on a leadership team who wants to lean in and listen to some guidance today in the area of cash flow, next week in the area of strategy. These occur every Wednesday in the United States at one o'clock Pacific, adjusted appropriately to your time zone worldwide. And listen in, learn, get a tool to apply, and then ask the experts. And so with that, I'll say welcome, Ian, and welcome, Keith, uh, to our webinar. Hey, Keith, great to be here from Vancouver, uh, Washington. And Ian, quick sound check. Can you hear us okay all the way from Brisbane? No problems, Keith, keeping you loud and clear. Okay, as we say with a little bit of humor, uh, good tomorrow morning in Brisbane, Australia. So everyone listening, today we're gonna to focus uh, on one of the seven attributes of profit, specifically underneath that, cash. How do you prepare and execute through the COVID-19, the war on COVID-19, the crisis, um, your cash flow and cash reserves? And we wanna start with a polling question. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll for everyone listening in. Okay, so uh, whether you're a leader, a business owner, uh, a guest coach, please go ahead and I'll pause for about 15, 20 seconds. I'll go silent as I launch this poll and uh, answer this on your screen if you would, please. Okay, we've got several answers coming in. And as we uh, wait for the polling results to come in, uh, let me ask our guest coaches, Ian and Keith, if you could go ahead and turn your video on so we can see you while you're interacting with the audience. That would be great. And uh, Michaela can help in the background if necessary. We would love to see you on the webinar as we interact here. Okay, right now, uh, the number one answer to the poll is cautious. So most people leaning in here are cautious about where they are with cash flow. Um, and then the next three areas that are equal are insecure, secure, and very confident. We don't have anyone that is indicating that they are distressed right now. Okay, uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started with some of our questions. And I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll out now. Thank you for uh, answering everyone. Appreciate it very, very much. Okay, Keith and Ian, first question today. Um, with a steep decline and slower recovery in front of us, okay, so COVID-19, the war on COVID-19 has come very, very quickly. And so within two weeks in the global economy, things have gone uh, into a steep decline relative to the generation of demand revenue. And then let's consider there might be a slower recovery on the other side. So it's a V shape with a steep decline on the left side than a, than a longer V on the right side. What cash flow and cash reserve strategies should a business consider? Um, Ian, why don't you lead us off on this, if you would, please. Sure, Keith. Like the first thing I'd probably suggest, you need to do regular forecasting. Uh, when we've been in periods of large growth, people have been lazy in relation to this uh, aspect of their business. It's been able to be done with an assumption of growth and therefore people haven't worried about it. But at the moment, you just have to do it. You really have to get into your forecast and try to predict how things are going to be for the business from a cash point of view in sort of monthly increments, weekly increments, daily increments, depending on your cycle and, and how much cash reserves you may have. Keith, over to you. Uh, Ian's right. The most important issue right now is to pay attention to cash flow. And I've been surprised at some of the uh, business leaders and entrepreneurs that I've interacted with over the last uh, five, six days, how many of them really don't know what their cash balances and reserves actually are. They really don't know yet, uh, you know, what availability they have on their line of credit. 
and much more, you know, what they owe or availability they have on revolving credits, such as Amex and others. And so it's very important uh, that they get their head around, you know, what their cash flow balance, what their cash balances are looking like, and more importantly, what cash they have available to them as they move forward through this crisis. Okay, gentlemen, so there's two things. One is uh, cash available, which could be in the bank, could be in securities, uh, could be in debt instruments, line of credit, et cetera, and then actual cash flow. Um, what do you recommend? How often do you recommend uh, the business owner, the CEO, president, uh, managing partner, look at cash flow? How, how, how frequent? Well, with my clients, um, I think it's very important uh, in normal times that they look at this once a week. You know, every Monday or every Friday, uh, they have their accounting team present a cash, a cash flow uh, balance tool uh, that they can share with the leader. But as we move into this, we move into this period of uh, crisis. I'm recommending that all my clients start looking at this every single day because things are changing so rapidly. For a while there, every week we'd see a change, and then it was every day, and now it's it appears to even be by the hour at times. Yeah, I, I got to agree with Keith on that one. Uh, you got to be looking at this daily, uh, and you got to be looking at that critical uh, sort of you know number of collections that I got overnight, and all those things just to keep it in touch with the the pulse of the uh, the cash flow. Okay, great. So uh, so the overall strategy then is look at cash regularly and know where your reserves and your opportunities are, which we'll go in uh, some more detail. Now let's get more specific and tactical, okay? So think in terms of writing the steep V down on the left side, and uh, we think we're near the bottom now or, or at or close, um, and then we'll have a slow ride up the other side. What are up to five specific tactical actions uh, to write it down successfully and prepare your cash flow. And here's how I'd like to handle this, gentlemen. Let's go back and forth. So, Keith, if you want to throw one out there, then we'll go over to Ian. We'll go back and forth, so to speak. Yeah, so I think uh, a really important one right now is any business owner, if you have not yet invested in good financial um, acumen, good financial support, or have that as a capability in your business, now um, it's more important than ever to actually get somebody behind you or around you that has this skill and expertise and that can support you um, in this cash flow that you should be paying attention to every day. Okay, so get a uh, trusted uh, uh, right-hand person either in the company or outside the company. Ian, over to you, tactical action step. And, and following on from Keith then, uh, one of the activities we like business owners to do is to allocate every line of their profit and loss to someone other than themselves or someone who's close to that particular expense and make them accountable for the activity in that line. And that enables the pressure on, say, the finance person or the CEO for that to be spread across the group and create a bit of an awareness of those uh, expenses. And as a team, you can come together and see what you can do to sort of try to reduce unnecessary expenditure and even from a point of view of revenue, see what things can be done to improve that part of the equation. Ian, what would be an example of that? Let's make that real for listeners real quick. Yeah, you might have like a certain expense like subscriptions or memberships and, and that will be there. And, and sometimes there's quite a lot of direct debit activity or things that are just been being paid by the business uh, unaware for a period of time. It's not until someone's allocated that accountability to appreciate, you know, that, that there's maybe some things we don't really need right now and see what you can do to potentially minimize the expenditure on those items. Okay, uh, Keith, over to you. Tactical action to strengthen or protect cash. Yeah, I want to add on something real quick that, that Ian just mentioned on expenses. And this is from my own personal experience. I've had travel or I've had to cancel up to seven business trips with clients um, and other types of business. And what I discovered in that is that was all, it was through three air, airlines, multiple hotels that were prepaid, rental cars, um, um, registrations for events. And it's been daunting trying to get my arms around, am I getting the proper credit? Are those certificates coming in? Are those miles being deposited into my wallet, et cetera? 
And I've actually had some airlines that just are refusing to refund my money. And so clients that have a lot of travel on their teams, they need to actually assign this um, as a follow-up item to somebody on their team to actually get their arms because that's a big, uh, that's a big leaky bucket if they don't get their hands around that quickly. Okay, Ian, over to you. And I think from here, another sort of tactic I'd suggest you can really do is like exchange guesswork with data. I think, you know, it's at the moment, you know, when you're looking at the potential V and recovery position, quite often people will think that we'll get back to the status quo. Speaking to a lot of my clients, I, I think everyone appreciates that there'll be a new world at the end of this. And what we need to make sure is that we have good data to be able to estimate what that may be and what that will look like. So try to, rather than sort of guessing what things may be or assuming that it might be the same as what it used to be before we went into COVID, that now we've got to really get some good data and try to really uh, use that forecast skill to sort of work out what those uh, new expenses, new revenue lines will be in the future. Ian, what would be maybe a, a few of the most important uh, data points to focus on first to be capturing? Well, it, it probably comes then to another tactic that I'd suggest, which is get really social with your customers and your suppliers. They're the people are going to be able to tell you what's happening in the market and then potentially uh, they'll be giving you good information as to what green shoots of new activity will potentially be coming out uh, as a result of, of the decline. And so they're the sort of data sources that you can then actually get a little bit more accuracy uh, from the market uh, data that you want to be using for your forecasts. Keith, back over to you. So um, another one I thought of is using 100% of the vendor terms that you have at your disposal. And what I mean by that, um, in good times when cash flow um, isn't an issue, it's easy for us to simply let the vendor uh, produce an invoice and then run our credit card or do an auto debit from our account the day the invoice is sent. And it really never mattered in the past. But today, we need to be thinking, and I hate to use the word hoard, but I'm going to use the word hoard, but we need to be thinking about hoarding cash temporarily as we move forward to make sure we have the fuel in our tank to, to, to keep going. And so what I mean by that is take uh, your vendor payments off of auto pay or off of auto credit card or auto debits and instead change them back to manual payments. You may be still be or want to pay with, you know, with a direct debit from your account or a credit card, but set it up so that you initiate that at the end of the term, the 30 or the 40 day terms that your vendor is giving you and not let your vendor just direct debit it the day the invoice is initiated. So taking control of what uh, you own, uh, taking control back. Yeah, taking control back and then use the terms that your vendor actually has offered you and that you actually have at your disposal. Use them to the maximum amount possible. Ian? I think, Keith, uh, just to go on to a slightly different subject, I was talking to a CEO yesterday about their approaches and what they're doing. And one of the things that's uh, somewhat inevitable, I think, for a lot of the businesses is that they're going to have to uh, reduce their workforce and so the, the term I'd use for this tactic and what he expressed was they're going to fire fast and hire slow. And I guess what we need to do is uh, make sure that anything that we don't need to be carrying into the new business uh, model as we move forward is try to let go of that sort of workforce that you won't need or maybe some people that won't be necessary for that next phase of the business. Uh, get in and make those cuts quickly because it's actually helping them while there's a lot of government assistance and benefits and programs able to be uh, provided to those sort of people in those situations, give them the opportunity to access that earlier rather than later down the line. Okay. And payroll is often the highest cost within a business. So there are different uh, options there. Uh, Keith Upkeys, back over to you. Another one is uh, to proactively manage your accounts receivable collections. In other words, money your customers owe you. Again, it's easy when things are good and cash is prevalent to send customers invoices and we love them and we trust them and they eventually do pay us, but we need to be more proactive and start calling for payments when they're due. If we've delivered a great quality product and a great level of service, we actually deserve to be paid and we need to assign somebody in our business that's following up with customers on these invoices and getting the cash into our bank instead of theirs. 
And Keith, if I can, just following on from uh, Keith Upkeys there, um, what I encourage business owners to think about is don't treat everything as absolutes. So you don't always just have to ask for 100% of the amounts or zero. Um, quite often there's a lot of room where you can, you know, as, as part of a goodwill, just ask for 50% or 20%. Just get some money coming in the door rather than always thinking that you can only go for the full, full amount of the debt. Yeah, Ian, Ian makes a really good point, you know, when you talk to your customers, when you're collecting on these invoices, maybe a question is, how much can you pay me today and how much can you pay me next week? Okay, Ian, another tactical action to protect cash flow. Well, it might seem obvious, Keith, but it's going back to checking your position regularly. Um, you, you can do your forecast and that's great, but you've got to check in and make sure how you're going against it. And so it's not just an exercise in itself. You've got to use it as a tool. And so it's important that you use that tool with your team so you can make sure where your position is at any given time. That will help determine the rate of the slide that you may be experiencing on cash flow or business activity and therefore being able to calibrate and make better decisions based on that knowledge. Keith Upkeys, let me put a question out there for you to, uh, to lead on and then we're going to come back to tactical actions. Um, if payroll is the largest expense, are there other ways to reduce payroll expense for an interim period of time? One that Ian suggested is to uh, identify the team members that you would not want to keep long term and then uh, let them go. Uh, other ideas or what you're seeing in the market? Yeah, a couple other ideas uh, would be to either defer some compensation uh, ask them to be a partner with you. I was on the line with a client this morning um, and he's got some people on his team who he loves and wants to keep and needs, but he needs to shore up some cash flow. So he's asking them to partner with him to make sure the business stays solid and sustainable. So there's actually a business to come back to when this crisis is over. And so he's asked them to partner with him and defer some, uh, some salary to a future date. That's one way to do it. The other thing, um, is if you want to keep your team in place, have a conversation with them and move all the team or portions of the team to partial workload. You know, you could lay three people off or instead the whole team could go down and work six hours a day instead of eight. And so you can defer your cash flow or, you know, lower your cash flow while keeping your core team in place. Those are a couple of ideas that I've run across this week talking to clients. And Keith, and so, further to that one, one of the uh, activities I've seen undertaken by some business owners is they'll get their team together and basically ask them to take a 20% or 25% pay cut. And in order to show the goodwill too, it's understood that the leaders will potentially take even a further pay cut than that. And they'll say, we'll take a 30%, 40% pay cut in order to keep the business intact and keep everyone employed. And let's go a little bit deeper here. Um, so Ian, you're based in Australia, have a regional view, and then Keith here in the United States. So this won't apply to other countries necessarily, but Ian, what are you seeing in your country, what the government is doing to help with payroll? Are there any programs or actions there? And then Keith will come over to you on that too. Well, Keith, yeah, what we're experiencing here, I think is similar across the globe. Uh, the governments are concerned about the number of people are going to be unemployed as a result of what's happening. And so a lot of their incentives and programs are geared towards employers keeping on their staff. And so we get to that position where a lot of the incentives that we're seeing provided by government in relation to loan funding and those sorts of things are very much geared to make sure that matches payroll expenses. And so what we're seeing as far as incentives are concerned is that the government will basically rebate to the employers a fair portion of the salary bill that the uh, owners uh, have to pay as part of the incentive. So basically it makes an, and gives them an incentive to keep going and keep paying their people. Okay, great. And uh, Ian, you can turn your video on now. Uh, we had a little uh, difficulty there, but Keith, over to you. What are you learning about uh, government assistance regarding payroll and uh, team members? Yeah, well, that's still a little bit murky here in the United States, because I think as of this morning, they were just still passing some of the legislation. Uh, but one of the things I'm understanding is they're beginning to loosen up the unemployment insurance application process. 
they're widening the range, they're making it easier, um, opening up some online tools to help people actually get access to that much sooner. And particularly in the crisis, instead of having them come and wait in line, they're getting some websites opened up so they can actually apply and make this easier for workers. Okay, good. And one other I'm tracking right now is the suspension or the deferment of payroll tax, yep. uh, which is about 12.5% in the United States. And so that'll allow a company to put 12.5%, uh, keep 12.5% more of their cash to invest in uh, keeping employees. Hey, Keith, um, I just thought of one other idea for your last question. And I heard a story this morning about a company that um, asked for volunteers. They said, we need to trim labor costs at this time. Do we have some volunteers that uh, may be looking for, you know, some time at home or, you know, just volunteer to step aside for now? And there was a case where this company could keep only one of two uh, workers. And one of the women, she raised her hand and say, said, you know, we have some cash reserves in our life. And my husband is in a critical business that's going to keep going forward. In fact, they're really busy right now. I'd be willing to stay at home for 30, 45 days if necessary without pay and let the other person go ahead and continue to work because I think it's really important for her that she continues to get a paycheck. And so I thought that was a really heartwarming story uh, that people are stepping up to help one another. Yeah, the, uh, the beauty of the human spirit is coming out in adversity. I'm hearing some of those stories too. So thank you for sharing that, Keith. Yeah. Okay, um, other tactical actions. We've talked about uh, assigning line items on the P&L uh, to individuals, uh, working with customers for payment, uh, working with vendors, um, uh, cutting uh, payroll or deferring. Uh, other things, uh, Keith and Ian, that you would like to put forward to our audience? Sure, I had one, I, one other one I had on my list this morning, and that is, you know, if you're in a, a business where you have inventory, product on the shelf, um, lighten your inventory load. We all know that the supply chain has slowed down. Um, and so lighten your inventory load so that you don't have so much cash sitting on the shelf, you know, in the back room or in the warehouse. As you move that inventory out, that replenishes cash. Keep that cash in your system, lighten the load again, and then use, you know, use those delivery options so you can slowly trickle material back in as you need it, as opposed to, you know, restocking the shelf to their full capacity at this point. Okay, Ian? Another one, Keith, that comes to mind is, um, you're gonna have some spare space potentially in uh, your, your business and the like. And in the line of like things like Uber and, and other share economy sort of models, see what you can do to potentially share those resources and potentially get some reimbursement for that. Quite often in these arrangements, when people may be looking for space or those sorts of things, then maybe you can sublet part of your premises and try to get some extra cash flow coming in from that point of view. So just have a look at what resources and assets that you have and whether, you know, there's downtime or, or uh, at periods where you know you might be able to have them rented out to others as another way to get the cash flow in. Okay, and and that's the shared economy principle, and and, and I'll go a little bit deeper on that. Um, Ian, that's great wisdom. If you're leading a company and listening in, pause, look at your core assets, and say, ask yourself, where do we have excess capacity? It could be physical office space as Ian shared, where someone needs to downsize their space, they could office share with you and pay you. It could be use of some of the talent on your team, uh, your talent, you could retain your talent and contract some of that out to a business that needs additional talent in a specific area like marketing or technology, et cetera. So think in terms of the capacity sharing model. Um, one thing I want to share, too, from Coach Jeff Redmond uh, in Minneapolis. He's writing a uh, monograph on cash. And uh, we had a little bit of a dialogue recently about go to your, if you're renting space, go to your landlord and ask them if you can defer or pay partial rent for a period of time. And that would apply to any of your vendors. Better, the principle is better to give some cash coming in to a tenant that will be here in a year than getting full payment from a tenant or a relationship that may not be here in three months. Okay, so it's the principle of continuity 
um, is a good a good one too. Keith Upkey's back to you. Tactical uh, actions and ideas. This is good stuff, guys. Keep it coming. This seems like a silly one, but if you do have some cash uh, reserves in your system, um, I've used this with a couple of clients several years ago and it worked really well, but move some of that money out of checking into a savings account or I call it the hidden war chest. What that does, it, re it reduces the access to that cash for either your accounts payable department or even for you. I've always said sometimes we have to protect the business from ourselves mm -hmm. sometimes. And so just by simply moving or moving that money from a, from a checking or a demand deposit account into some sort of a savings vehicle or a hidden war chest, it just makes access to that um, less and so it just helps you with your, your savings plan and building up your cash reserves. It seems silly, uh, but I've had it work uh, with two clients really well in the past. Okay, great. Based on experience. Yeah. Um, Ian. Following on from Keith's point just there, um, I've had a few clients uh, adopt uh, a principle called Profits First. Uh, it's a book that's out, and it's basically a methodology of how do you allocate the cash that you get in across your various expenses. And it's exactly like Keith was describing, the, the excess amount gets put in accounts which don't have immediate transparency. You don't see it and therefore you, you get used to living off less or the 70% or 60% of the cash flow that is in the, in the account. And so that's a, a, a good resource that I've used some clients use, book called Profits First, and it helps with how do I deal with the cash flow that's coming into the business and what accounts can I put it in to make sure that I only spend that money when needed? Okay, great. Keith, uh, Keith, back over to you. Um, another one I thought about was um, the owner of the business or the leader of the business. Take control and manage how the cash leaves your business. And I'm thinking again in terms of vendors. Um, typically vendors, they'll build relationships with say Bill or Susan in the accounting department. And I know that I just have to call Bill or Susan and they'll pay me because we have a relationship. You know, I send her a box of chocolates at Christmas. And what you want to do as an owner is take control back of that and monitor and manage how the cash gets dispersed. In times like this, I may leverage those relationships and call Susan or Bill and say, hey, can you, can you get me some cash? I need some cash. And, and sometimes they'll do that because of the relationship. But as an owner, I want you to control uh, how cash actually leaves the business. You control what vendors get paid and how much and when. Okay, great. Ian? Um, when going back to sources of cash, Keith, I, I think you shouldn't ignore the relationship you may have with your banker. Um, look, we're all going through a situation at the moment and just being open and honest with your situation because as we'd appreciate, many businesses are in this, sit, uh, in this spot. And therefore, just being open and honest and having good information to be able to share with your banker, that may be able to provide uh, some assistance or additional cash flow that can be given to the business because of your relationship and also the quality of the information that you're providing them. And so just, yeah, lean on the existing relationship that you may have with those sort of people. Okay, good. I'll throw one in too, as a business owner myself, um, is... Uh, if you, in, in, in some countries, this is uh, true in the United States, uh, probably many other countries, if you have a retirement account for yourself, okay, not the business yourself, or if you have whole life insurance uh, in the United States, you can actually borrow a portion of that at a favorable rate uh, for a period of time, up to five years, I believe it is. So if you're an owner with your own retirement and your own whole life insurance, you have two hidden sources of debt capital that you can draw upon if you choose to that a lot of owners are not aware of. Okay, so, uh, so be aware of that too. Okay, Keith, back over to you. Yeah, I was on the phone this morning uh, with a client uh, talking about this very topic. And um, this goes back to an age old rule, you know, stay financially healthy, have a strong balance sheet, keep good relations with your lenders. And what he shared with me was he reached out yesterday to his banker who he has a good relationship with. And because he's had good credit for a number of years, he's always paid his term debt on time, never late, has good relationships with his bank. He asked them if they might be able to support him during this time. And he said, I was surprised at how easy it was. He's a small business, but how easy it was for me to get a $50,000 
term loan for 36 months. And he said, I have to go by the bank today and sign the documents and they'll deposit the money in my account tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's leveraging those banking relationships um, to your benefit to help you right now. Okay, excellent. Ian, back over to you. And, and guys, we're just going to keep going until we drain, uh, drain the swamp here. This is fantastic. And let me uh, say to the listening audience, feel free to get the Q&A coming. I'm going to start monitoring the Q&A coming from the audience. But Ian, back over to you. I think just get out there and be social with your suppliers and your customers and the like. I think you know, mentally when uh, business owners are in a bit of a down, they tend to insulate their problems and not want to talk it through. Um, I, I would suggest to business owners that we're all in some sort of um, uh, distress at the moment and the best thing we can do is get social and get out there. Now, obviously, with closure of certain sort of venues and the like, that some of those opportunities may be a bit less than what they used to be. But we have the uh, mediums like this and just pick up a phone and being able to talk to people can help, I guess, get some ideas going and, and just getting some information out there to others. So, you know, uh, opportunities like you just spoke about before, Keith, around accessing uh, additional funds, uh, people will find out about these things. And so I think just as a general strategy, just get social and just keep communication lines open uh, with your community. Okay, great. Keith Upkeys. Um, I was thinking about uh, building and extending partnerships. So like with customers, you know, talk to your customers, be open and honest with them, see what their stress is, continue to help them. Um, offer ways and for them to expedite payments to you. If you haven't offered credit card payments in the past, mm -hmm. do it now. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody, their pushback to me always has been, well, it costs 3% fee. And I tell them, yeah, but if you get your, if you get your cash, you know, two days after the invoice versus 45, 50, 60 days later, it may be worth it. So look for ways to um, enhance and extend those partnerships, how to expedite customer payments, um, suggest auto debits from their bank account. You know, can I just set that up so we can auto debit your bank account, make it easy on you because you're shortening your staff on that side, make it easy on me. Same thing with vendors, you know, talk to your key vendors. They want to keep you as a customer and they want to keep selling to you when this comes back and ask them how they can help you. How can they extend some additional terms to you in the short term? Can you change your terms with them? How frequently you pay? Can you make, you know, three equal payments instead of one payment? But look to those partners that you've got that you've worked with for years, those strong relationships, and deepen those relationships and those partners to benefit both of you. Okay, good. Okay, last round, then we'll go on to question three and questions are beginning to come in too. So Ian, uh, last tactical item of uh, action you would suggest to the audience of business owners and leaders. Um, it, given the situation, there's still a lot of people that potentially have seen this coming or, or knew that some sort of event like this was, was potentially in, in, in the making. And there's a lot of private individuals who are fairly cashed up at the moment. And so one of the opportunities to potentially access some cash is, you know, touch your network, see if there's anyone there who's wanting to invest in, say, a small and medium-sized business in order for them to be able to have sufficient cash flow to sort of go to that next stage. Uh, the investment opportunities that a lot of these people have uh, have been reduced quite a bit. And we know corporate and larger co uh, organisations are, are going to be hurting just as much as the mid-sector and the small business. And so as a result, there'll be some private individuals that will be keen to see what they can do from an investment point of view with their money in even smaller sort of stocks or, or businesses. So having and leaning on some of those relationships might identify someone that can really help you at this point in time. Okay. So as public markets have very little yield, private individuals may have an appetite if they know you and know your character, right, Ian? Correct. Okay. Keith, uh, last item before we go into question three. Yeah, this, this kind of goes back to something Ian mentioned a little bit ago, but it's back to your P&L. Um, even conservative run companies, if you look long and hard at your P&L, there are some things in there that you absolutely can live without. Shore your cash flow up by increasing profitability. The only way you can generate positive cash flow without additional lines of credit or borrowing is to increase profitability. So look for all those opportunities to increase margin and profitability right now and think about some of those nice to haves 
uh, that really didn't matter, you know, when things are really, really good and see if you can't pause those for the time being because it will make a difference. It really, really will. And then the last thing I just want to point out is learn from these times. I remember I had a client back in 2008 and I was helping her through this same time of a crisis. And she said, boy, coach, I've never had to manage my business this way. And my response to her was, well, we should have all been managing businesses this way from the beginning, and we should manage businesses this way going forward. And so also, let's learn from this time and figure out how can we run our businesses stronger and better with more positive cash flow going forward. I'm seeing two things on that topic, uh, Keithy, in an audience, is because of the stress from COVID-19, the clarity in managing and watching cash and the skill is rising quickly. And as people begin to breathe deeply now, innovation is beginning to rise on the horizon. How do we do things differently for our clients in the market? And so that's pretty exciting. Okay, last two I'll throw in real quick. Uh, number one, if you're an owner, uh, consider lowering your compensation because you can make that up in, at a later date in either salary or profit, and uh, you have more staying power as the, uh, as the business owner. And then secondarily, and this is very strategic, if you have a customer that meets two criteria, number one, you are critical in their success. Your business provides a service or product to the customer, and it's critical to their long-term success and they're financially very strong. Your customers also can be a way of financing to you because they have a need for you strategically, a good healthy dependence, and they have cash, which they could potentially loan to you that you could repay in the future at a discount or appropriate terms. So don't forget, uh, think strategically as you look into your customer base. Okay, uh, we have one question we're gonna, uh, we're gonna ask, then we'll go on to uh, question three. This one's from the audience, excuse me. Uh, so this comes from Mike. How can or should you deal with customers that are having their own cash flow issues? So if you're a, a business and your customers are having cash flow issues, if they're unable to pay you on time, how strict should you be with your own customers? Um, Keith, Ian, any comments on that? I guess it comes back to the relationship that you have with that particular person. Uh, ultimately, uh, people do business with people and it's having a, a relationship that you can sort of explore and understand their true situation through your dialogue and, and through uh, your previous interactions and be able to just come up with an arrangement. I think if you can show goodwill and compassion now, assuming that you're not in a, a, such a critical position that you need money in right now, and potentially just explain that that's the situation. But if you do have an ability to be able to sustain uh, a period longer than maybe others, extend that goodwill, show your compassion, show you uh, are willing to sort of be flexible at this point in time. And that investment in that relationship should prove dividends down the track. Uh, and that would be sort of the experience that we're seeing a lot of business owners um, have when they're confronted with this question. Okay, good. Keith? Yeah. yeah, I'm engaged or I'm involved with another group and we have this topic come up earlier in the week and, and somebody said something that really resonated with me and they said, um, it's better, to, what they're really getting at is play the long game right now. Uh -huh. If you've got a business that you want to come back to after this crisis is over, um, it may be better to stay engaged with a client with no money coming in than to not be engaged with a client or a customer and have no money coming in or never get paid for the invoice that's out there. So in other words, if you have the ability to play the longer game, stay engaged, continue to help your customers, help them solve their problems, help them with the product they need, um, and, the, and help them with the payment, you know, offer some terms to them. Hey, can you give me half now and half, you know, 30 days from now? Um, can we engage on a 50% of our, of our um, monthly retainer for the next three months and then make that up the back half of the year when things come back? You want to get flexible and get innovative with how your customers pay you if necessary so that those customers that love you and refer business to you and that are profitable for you will be there when this crisis ends. Mm -hmm. 
and drawing upon a principle that Ian shared earlier, it's not black or white. There's the amount of payment and then there's the delivery of services. And within that grid of the amount of payment and delivery of services, there are different choices. As a customer, you could deliver partial product for payment or you could suspend and there's different choices. Also think in terms of 60 or 90 day blocks, everyone, uh, make you put a bound on it. Don't leave it open if you're gonna suspend or defer a payment. You know, make it your 90 days and then visit it based on the changing condition so that you can work through a time frame increment at a time. And as their business rises, then you can suspend that as you do these reviews. Okay, yeah. don't leave it open ended. Okay, thank you, Mike, for that question. Uh, let's go on now to our third and last question here uh, for our experts. Okay, where and how can companies find outside cash? to make it through and position for growth on the other side. So we've talked a little bit about this already, Keith and Ian, but let's, let's visit it again uh, and either or add to it. Companies that uh, are prepared to be on the other side of the V curve, steep decline, longer, slower rise, where can they cash after they've stabilized as they think about growing into the future? Ian, you want to lead us off on that one? Yeah, uh, quite often in these times, Keith, there's been some traditional um, products that have been offered by financiers that potentially have been ignored when you're in high growth or not worried about that, that may be available now. One that comes to mind is um, factoring or debt of financing. So if you've got a number of uh, customers, and they may be good customers, uh, but they're unable to pay you the full amount of their debts right now, quite often a bank will be prepared to extend um, the period of time that those people pay, but give you immediate finance. It may be 80% or 75% of the value of that book that they'll be able to give you as cash right now on the basis that the customers then will just pay the bank rather than pay you. So that's a one way that typically people have frowned on that as factoring or uh, debt of financing has been a, a problem. But in this situation, it could be a useful way to find some cash. Okay, great. Keith Upkeys. Another one that came up earlier in the week was, um, are there some potential equity partners? There are some, some businesses, there are some entrepreneurs that do have cash available and they're looking for good places to invest that. The market's so volatile right now, they're looking for other opportunities. And so one client I talked to said he was looking for an equity partner to shore him up cash flow wise but somebody that was strategic in nature that could actually bring something and help him. So do be open to considering equity partners that can actually help you through this time and could actually actually help you uh, when this crisis ends. Okay. Ian, anything else to add to that? Uh, another one that we're seeing commonly in, in Australia is um, you get a lot more incentives when you hire apprentices and those sort of type of, of people. So the government, has a number of programs available to businesses, uh, not only, I guess, in these situations, but generally. And, and one way you can get additional cash from the government is obviously trying to boost the, the, the people joining the workforce for the first time. So there may be some opportunities there to put on some younger people uh, and, and uh, those sort of types of groups that, that may enable you to get some additional cash that, that typically others might have sort of looked at previously. Mm -hmm. Okay. Keith Upkeys. I was thinking about this a lot this morning. And one of the things uh, that I've been talking with clients about this week is, are, is there a segment of your market that actually is growing and not shrinking? And do you have the ability to quickly innovate or pivot um, and pick up some of that market share? And that's another way to look for some, some cash on the outside that isn't flowing to you now. But is there an innovative way to, to tap into a, mark, a piece of the market that you operate in? that may be growing. So again, be thinking outside the box, every, you know, no idea is a bad idea, but get ideas on the board and that may be one that you may be able to leverage in the short term. Okay. Following on from that one, Keith, uh, we've just seen recently here, um, a company that, that makes alcohol and typically they, they've been a distillery and the like and making it for spirits. But with the, the demand through licensed venues and clubs decreasing because those establishments are closed, um, they've redirected those resources into hand 
sanitizer mm -hmm. and being able to use their product in order to sort of be good because it's in high demand at the moment. There's, there's a lot of shortages in relation to those sorts of products. And so they're redirecting their resources to make something that's really in high demand and useful. And that's another way for them to be generating cash when otherwise they wouldn't be making any money on those other products. Okay. So the principle there is take a core competency, in this case, liquid um, research development and production alcohol distillery and point it at a market that needs the core competency, a different liquid that is in high demand. Okay. Uh, excellent example. Uh, Keith? Yeah, and so back to what I was just mentioning, uh, brought back um, a client example of mine. He's in the home restoration business, fire and flood. And one other thing he does is he helps with sanitation um, of homes. And what he talked about yesterday was um, innovating and quickly pivoting and offering sanitation services of commercial office buildings. Mm -hmm. So offices are closed, people are working from home, now's a great time to get in there, sanitize these office buildings with products and experience he already has uh, on hand while these workers are home. So when this crisis is over and they start to work their way back into these commercial office buildings, they're ready to go. And I think that's going to be the one, the one innovation that gets him through this time period because all the home restoration business has subsided. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Well, gentlemen, let's uh, begin to bring it to a close. I've got another question here in a moment, uh, but we'd like to try and keep these to 45 to 50 minutes, bite-sized chunks. Uh, listening audience, uh, we do this each Wednesday at 1 o'clock Pacific and uh, please go ahead and uh, join us next week. We're going to be talking about doing the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats analysis. As you look into the future with rapidly changing circumstances around us, the foundation of your business may have changed. And well, what is the foundation? Understanding where you're strong, where you're weak, where the opportunities ahead are as the market changes, and then any unforeseen just like we have the COVID-19 threat come upon us. So next week we'll shift from uh, profit uh, and sp focusing on cash into strategy, reestablishing the foundation of your business through a working exercise. We'll have two expert coaches from around the world. Okay, um, Keith and Ian, final guidance to business owners and leading uh, leaders listening in on cash. What's your uh, closing comments and then I'm going to ask you about resources. Uh, Keith, closing comments? Yeah, just, you know, just be honest with yourself and, and be vulnerable with yourself. Um, if, if, if you don't really understand your finances or your cash flow, don't be embarrassed by that. Now's the time to raise your hand and say, I need help. And get the right help around you. There may be somebody on your team. You may have a colleague, a family member. Um, heck, I know Ian and I would both welcome a call and be happy to help. But if but just don't be afraid. Raise your hand, get some help, get your arms around it. You know, your business and your teammates and your family depend on it. Okay, thank you, Keith Thupkes. Ian Judson. Uh, yeah, and going back to Keith's point earlier, this is a learning period. Um, quite often with business owners, we've seen them either come from strong sales backgrounds or strong operational backgrounds, and they've generally ignored finance or, or treated it as something that someone else will handle. Now's a great time for business owners to really appreciate that function of their business. School up, learn from others, work with others who have that skill and enable them to have a better skill set as they move forward into the future. Okay, good, good. And uh, gentlemen, we have a couple of questions that I will send to you individually and connect you with the, uh, the team member, the leader asking. Um, last question, and I'll give you a pause a moment. What are one or two resources, very practical resources, could be a book, a website, a checklist that you would suggest uh, that our listening audience check out regarding cash and cash reserves? Keith up, please. Yeah, one that comes to mind, and um, some on the call may even have this, but I always say get back to, you know, the original tools we've always used and the cash conversion cycle is a great tool and a great exercise. It's part of our seven attributes of agile growth um, toolbox. 
So if you really don't understand the ins and outs of your cash flow, that one be, might be a place to start, is to chart your cash conversion cycle so you really understand how cash flows through your business. And I think it'd be very helpful for many of these small businesses. Okay, and listening audience, we'll make the cash conversion cycle uh, one page available as downloadable to you. And don't forget, if you need help with that, reach out to us here at Gravitas and we'll put you in touch with the coach. We'll follow up and help you. Ian, uh, final uh, words and guidance for our listening audience? Yeah, the, the resource that comes to mind is the one I mentioned earlier, Keith, is that Profits First book. I'm just seeing more and more business owners appreciate the simplicity of the model in that one. And it's just a way of being able to manage your cash flow uh, in a very easy to understand and practical way. Uh, and I would highly recommend that book in relation to how business owners may want to be dealing with their situation uh, in, in the next little while. I guess just final comments would be, yeah, this is a long game uh, at, at the moment when we're looking at this situation while we're dealing with new cycles that have continual updates and things that are changing around the globe. Uh, from a business point of view, you have to adopt a, a, a longer mindset and, and trying to make sure that you can think about these things over a period of three to six months is probably the suggestion I'd have. Keep your energy up, work through these issues and try to build those habits and disciplines that we'll see through and be able to be used for a long period of time. Okay, great. And uh, Keith Upkeys, I think you had created a checklist. Uh, can I make that available to the listening audience too? Certainly, please do. Okay, and the book I'll recommend uh, is called The Customer Funded Business. And it talks about how to work with your customers uh, in, uh, as you grow. And so the customer funded uh, business. So take a look at that listening audience. Let me see if we have any other questions that uh, we'd want to answer publicly here. No, nope, I think that's good for now. So uh, Ian and Keith, thank you again, listening audience. Thanks uh, for uh, leaning in. This webinar is recorded. We're making it available to everyone who listened in as well as the public through our website, uh, gravitasimpact.com forward slash corona for resources there. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you.